Okay, PTG 300, which I'll call 300 from now on, is a hepcidin mimetic. And if you recall, hepcidin is a molecule that is involved with uh, iron trafficking. Essentially, it uh, blocks the absorption of iron from the gut and also um, the release of iron from macrophages. So if you've seen patients with polycythemia vera, you realize that this, um, this uh, that most patients with uh, polycythemia, overwhelming majority of patients with polycythemia vera are iron deficient. And um, the, uh, the sort of amazing thing about polycythemia vera is that due to these mutations in JAK2, these, the red cell precursors in these patients can utilize the small amounts of iron that is released from these macrophages or absorbed from the gut to essentially continue to produce hemoglobin and make uh, red blood cells. So the theory behind the use of this molecule really, really um, was the, based upon a preclinical study that was done in an animal model of patients, uh, of mice with, that, in, that were transplanted with the uh, mutation 617F that developed a syndrome that resembles polycythemia vera. And what these investigators at Cornell um, showed um, years ago was that the, the administration of um, hepcidin emetics essentially corrected the elevation of hematocrit and actually led to the reduction of, of hematocrit levels. And that information lied dormant until uh, we started our interaction with protagonists, my colleague and I, uh, Elena Ginsberg, who's an expert in iron metabolism. And what we had batted around was, could we recapitulate those uh, studies that have been done in animal models in humans? And what we were most uh, intrigued by was essentially not only hematocrit control, which is a cardinal feature, a uh, cardinal rule for um, cardinal target, I should say, for patients with, with polycythemia vera. But we also conjectured that this might, this correction of iron metabolism with hepcidin might essentially uh, lead to a reversal of some of the constitutional symptoms that are associated with polycythemia vera, such as fatigue or uh, what people call a fuzzy um, brain, which patients report to us um, that they have difficulty doing uh, difficult men uh, mental activities or high risk type mental activities. And since hemoglobin, since iron is a, is a uh, metal that is used in a variety of proteins throughout the body, we, uh, we and others have attributed some of these non hematologic consequences of iron deficiency as being in the cause of many of the systemic symptoms that are associated with polycythemia vera. So uh, when we interacted initially with protagonists um, and they had this hepcidin mimetic that had been evaluated in patients with, with uh, hemochromatosis and also in, with patients with uh, thalassemia and seemed to have an extremely uh, limited uh, adverse event uh, profile associated with it. We, we underwent discussions with them and really the study was uh, uh, created by them uh, after these initial discussions to go on uh, to see if this drug would be useful to, uh, with patients with polycythemia vera. So we wanted to select a cohort of patients where we could really show that there was a difference in phlebotomy um, uh, need. So uh, we, the protocol that was created uh, essentially requires that those individuals um, have at least three phlebotomies in the six months prior to, to entry onto the trial. So that, those are the, primarily the entry criteria. The patients could be on hydroxyurea prior to the entry into the trial. So we screened a, a patient, patient population um, that had a high phlebotomy requirement that others have suggested might be predictive of, th of a increased thrombotic risk. Those patients then uh, went on uh, the protocol received during the first uh, uh, several months of treatment, a dose escalation from 10 to 80 milligrams of this drug, which is administered weekly 
uh, subcutaneously. During that period of time, there was dose titration um, in order to develop a, a dose of the drug weekly that led to um, the target hematocrit. And then there was a period of time um, over 28 weeks where the patients essentially <clears throat> had maintenance therapy where they were able to achieve um, hematocrit stabilization. They were able to continue their other medications. And then there's a period of time of randomization where patients uh, either are randomized to placebo or to continue treatment with 300. That uh, randomization was instituted to see what would happen if the, uh, if the drug was discontinued. Did the erythrocytosis um, return that characterized polycythemia vera or also was there a return of systemic symptoms? After this randomization period, everybody in the trial then goes on to again receive um, uh, 300 for a, for, a, for a prolonged period of time. So the good news is this is a, a early phase clinical trial. The clinical, the uh, safety profile was extremely favorable. Uh, we anticipated this based upon the patients being, uh, that were treated with hemochromatosis and thalassemia, and this, the abnormal, uh, the toxicities were essentially limited to cutaneous skin reactions. Um, so, and that was quite manageable. And um, so what uh, the findings to me were kind of, were not kind of, were extremely remarkable because, you know, we had this um, record of these people requiring uh, repeated phlebotomies and uh, with the administration of the, of the drug, those phlebotomies were no longer required um, and hematocrits were almost uniformly um, maintained below 45%. There was one exception to that, one patient who missed several doses due to the present pandemic, and that individual had one phlebotomy during the period of time of treatment. Admittedly, we only really have long-term follow-up or significant follow-up in about seven patients, but the trial continues to uh, accrue patients to a total of uh, 50, 50 patients, which and this accrual will occur um, at multiple centers throughout the United States. Um, the other remarkable thing is nobody had a thrombotic episode during this period of time, and nobody fortunately had progression to myelofibrosis or to MPN blast phase. And I must emphasize that this is a limited observation period. Um, the other remarkable features are that the patients who were severely iron deficient during prior to the institution of the drug, their um, serum ferritin started to rise and to normalize, indicating um, that we were essentially affecting iron metabolism. And anecdotally, at least, some patients appeared to have improvement in their systemic symptoms. One must ask then, how, are the, how is the drug really acting? Um, so the idea is that basically whatever iron is present within these patients um, is probably in macrophages and we feel, which is present in multiple tissues. And the present hypothesis is that uh, hepcidin, the hepcidin mimetic that we're using is essentially blocking the release of, of iron from these macrophages. And if you recur, if you remember from the uh, erythropoiesis literature, these macrophages, nursing macrophages, are important for red blood cell production. That's how iron is transported into these erythroid precursor cells. Um, and in those, in the, in the present hypothesis is that the iron release, the nursing macrophagia, the iron release is prevented, therefore essentially starving the erythroid precursors uh, of additional iron, but allowing iron to remain in non-hematologic uh, tissues, hematopoietic tissues, hopefully uh, allowing patients to have uh, less of these systemic symptoms. Since none of the patients really had extensive splenomegaly, um, we were unable really to evaluate whether the spleen size would be reduced 
um, in these uh, in these uh, patients, but hopefully in the future, the when the whole cohort is filled, uh, we'll be able to see if, like in the animal model, where hepcidomimetic therapy was associated with splenic. Um, that this uh, will also lead to reduction in spleen size. It's important to remember that splenomegaly, unlike myelofibrosis, is not a prominent feature usually in patients with polycythemia vera, and really the patients have symptomatic splenomegaly only at the end stages of their disease. Uh, one other issue, it's important. So one of the issues that we'd like to really emphasize, I'd like to emphasize, about this drug is that if the target, if maintenance of the target hematocrit below 45% is really a, the only means that we have, the primary means that we have of reducing thrombotic episodes, we want to have a drug that's going to be administered for long periods of time that are going to be, uh, that is going to be able to sustain this uh, level of normalization of the hematocrit. So what we usually do, especially with patients who are on phlebotomy therapy alone, or even those patients who are on one of the other drugs that I've discussed previously, we bring patients back intermittently, and it's a, a frequently these patients require supplemental phlebotomy over time. So the real advantage of this drug, at least based upon the limited clinical experience that we presently have, is that there's sustained hematocrit control Therefore, we, the patients appear to be almost uniformly below this 45% level, and we're hoping that that's going to essentially determine whether that is going to lead to a further reduction in thrombotic episodes. Whether this, is gonna, uh, this therapy is going to essentially affect the other metrics of the uh, biomarkers that we have for this disease, such as progression, of the disease or reduction in the jak 2 v 617 f allele burden um, or other additional effects on hematopoiesis is yet to be determined and hopefully will be determined in animal models and the actual patients that we're treating presently. Um, you know, the, tr the accrual onto this trial continues. Um, it's obviously been affected by the present pandemic where most academic centers have tried to limit the number of patients that are coming in for uh, treatment. So as things ramp up, um, at least at our institution at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, we're hoping to put additional patients uh, forward. My hope is that um, this data will be presented at a meeting you know, toward the end of the year um, where we can at least have a, a larger set of patients that are available to be presented to the scientific uh, uh, group. Eventually, what's going to happen is there's going to, we're trying to meet with a group of experts in these particular areas to try and tr uh, construct a strategy by which this drug would be evaluated in a phase three trial and uh, see if it's uh, essentially going to be a candidate for approval by the Federal Drug Administration. But admittedly, this is just in the infancy.